Good evening. It's so nice to be with you today on such an auspicious day. Happy summer solstice. I would say that barring my kids' birthdays, this is my favorite day of the year. Um, I'm sure you all understand that the Earth leans a little bit when it spins around every day, and we're on this huge carousel ride, and we go around the sun, and when we hit today, just today, we are leaning into the light just a little bit more. I love that. <laughs> I'm going to share some thoughts with you about my practice as an artist and why making art is important in my life. In my experience, we turn to art in order to ask questions that can't be asked anywhere else. Art is a language unto itself, and that by looking and listening and witnessing with sensitive attention what artists are doing and what they're saying, we might discover things that we can't gain anywhere else. At the very least, expanding our everyday experience by engaging with art that might be altogether unfamiliar or challenging or maybe even threatening at first, it opens us up to be more sympathetic to ideas in general and to experiences and cultures that are beyond our own. I brought a few examples of some of my work. Um, the small black and white piece here is called Mari Imbrium, and it's about the moon. The large color work here is called Tatar Fire, and uh, this is one of a series of studies I made for a mural commission. This shows the final artwork at a much smaller scale, and the commission was from the Columbia Museum of Art in um, Columbia, South Carolina. That was in 2012. Both of these works are composed from text. I have redrawn the shapes of individual letters from stories and I've changed them into these abstracted shapes that you see here in the final artworks. And um, this allows me to tell stories on several levels. I use digital tools in my studio to accomplish this and I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go. Um, this third work here is not made from text, but um, it addresses this digital age in which we live and the idea of automation. And I'm fascinated to learn that automation's been around for a thousand years. They found uh, antique, uh, antique uh, primitive uh, music boxes in ancient Egypt. And so if you take electricity away from computers, you end up with automation. 200 years ago, they invented the Jacquard loom, where they automated um, the weaving of uh, tapestries by making these punch cards that these little mechanical levers would move back and forth and move the fabric through the loom. And then following that, they invented the player piano, which is an unbelievable invention where a, a, a skilled musician would play a piece on the piano, and then this each key of the piano is hooked into these levers that would punch holes in paper and then this paper roll goes to the piano and it's reproduced. And no one's touching the piano, it's playing itself. That's pretty close to a digital experience without the electricity, if you ask me. They had pneumatic pumps, though these days they have electricity so you don't have to pump the pedals, but the, uh, the markings that you see there in the horizontal lines are actual tracings from one of the piano rolls. So that's actually a little snippet of music, I think. Um, from Joey Will Morton, I think. I have, to, I have to go back and check my notes, but that's the actual music itself. So, um, I wanted to introduce these works to you and uh, introduce the idea of scale. Can you get those lights? Yep, yeah, thank you. I want to talk about the idea of scale um, how things that we witness at a personal level fit into the greater scheme of things, uh, because so much of what I do takes place within this sort of imaginary virtual world of computers. Um, I do a lot of visualizing and uh, imagining of what shapes will look like and what size they'll be when they come back out as an actual painting. I'll mainly discuss uh, Tatara Fire and how it came to be made by sharing some of the inspirations for the work. 
and why it's important to the community in Colombia. And my theme tonight is transformation through fire. I am the kind of person who asks a lot of questions, generally. I'm preoccupied with the mysteries of life. And no doubt the circumstances of my life have prompted me on a long journey to find out for myself how things fit together. I'll give you a little background. I was born in Manhattan, and when I was very young, my family moved out to Lachman. And when I was nine, we moved to Mamaroneck. Mamaroneck is a very special place. I raised a family here on my own, and we all graduated from Mamaroneck High School. And while I was growing up, access to New York City made it easy for me to live two lives, both urban and suburban. But when I was growing up here, there was something that was out of balance. There was a, there was a split in my family. It wasn't a divorce. My folks were together for 60 years. It was a different kind of a separation, which gave me a, a, a feeling of dislocation. I felt like I didn't really fit in with my family. There was a big chapter of my family which took place in Asia before I was born. After World War II, my parents, as newlyweds in 1949, traveled to the Philippines and they lived in Manila for 12 years. And my sister and brother were born there. And the family had set up a whole life there. And any Westerners that were there after the war to rebuild, they lived pretty well. My father worked in the motion picture business, distributing movies to a new open Asian market in Taiwan and Tokyo and Hong Kong. That market was very hungry for Western movies. And my mother raised her family and she created all the costumes for the local theater guild and she prayed that she would never have to use the anti-snake bite venom that she kept in the refrigerator. <laughs> but as they tell me, it was a pretty idyllic world of art. So, so, so there was this place that shaped the family in every way, culturally, and when they returned to New York, my mom was pregnant with me, and the change was huge and dramatic. This in turn uh, prompted me, when I was old enough, to start asking a lot of questions about things. Our house in Larchmont was different than other homes because it was filled with paintings and sculptures and objects and ivory and Tons of things I'm pretty sure you would not be allowed to bring back into the country these days. And these things reminded them of their home over there in the Philippine Islands. But none of it made any sense to me. Uh, I was fascinated, but I was sure that I was, I was missing something. But whatever collective memory that my family had was located in another world. I was trying to connect in my imagination to this family place that was out there on the other side of the earth. and. It was so important to everybody, and surrounded by all this alien culture as a child, I, I mean, nobody else had any of this stuff. So, <clears throat> I kind of projected myself out into space so that I could place myself there, too. This is total ground for developing your imagination. So, from the very beginning, I was searching for ways to get to places that I would never go and ways to express what that felt like. The first memorable experience I had, which came to my aid and opened up the possibility to a different way of communicating, was a visit to an artist's studio right here in Larchmont. And that artist's name was Alton Toby. He painted some very heavy-handed and dramatic portraits. And you may have seen it because um, he has some wonderful murals in quite a few buildings in my plains. So the class trip was organized by Murray Avenue School. And I, I hope our schools are still organizing this kind of thing. We held hands and we walked to his home studio from school. And my life has changed. The smell of wet oil paint for the first time and those dramatic portraits he so kindly shared with us, were, they were mesmerizing. I secretly decided in second grade I wanted to be an artist so that I, too, could make things real that were forever beyond reach of my imagination. I, I mean, I thought I could make them real. I was only seven. But from then on, I started to look at things differently. But let's 
talk about Tatara Fire. The story of Tatara Fire begins in ancient Japan. It's made with unconventional tools and materials, and it's a painting that's uh, it's kind of a hybrid between the actual and the virtual. The mural installed is 11 by 26 feet, and uh, it's composed at a scale that suggests a journey. You travel as you walk across the face of the piece to follow the large expanse of shapes and lines. Practically invites you to leap in there and move through the space yourself. It's part of a group of artworks that share a similar theme. And uh, although this group of artworks are about fire as a creative process, I saw that there might also be some connection to historical events in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. South Carolina, you may recall, was the first to secede from the Union at the start of the Civil War. And um, Columbia was marking its 150th anniversary of the burning of the city by Sherman's army at the end of the war. So although the painting is not a memorial, it does contain the names of some of the landmarks and government buildings that burned. It was a sensitive subject, to, to say the least, but providing the community of Columbia with a mural that stimulates conversations about history and progress is what I hope to achieve. A lot of work, a lot of my work grows out of the idea of uh, first principles. And by that I mean the fundamental forces at play in our everyday world, you know, principles that govern the stuff that we see and interact with in our everyday life, the theories behind uh, physics or electromagnetism or how the biology of our bodies allow us to hear and see how things work on a fundamental level. That's pretty geeky, I know. But it's exciting to me to figure out ways to make pictures about the world as it actually is, and not just as we see it. I love this quote from Anais Nin. We don't see things as they actually are. We see things as we are. And with this in mind, I've chosen to work mainly with abstraction as a strategy to find ways of seeing things in a new light, and to show the essence of the thing itself, and not just a thing depicted. And I found a surprising example of something that transcended its own essence. It was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2009. And it was an exhibition about the art of the samurai sword. Just the metal swords, not the decorative wrappings. It was the metal itself. And when I visited, I had an epiphany seeing what the Japanese considered to be sacred steel on display there in the form of these ancient swords. I wasn't particularly interested in ancient weapons as a subject for artwork, but sacred steel. Sacred steel? <laughs> what could make steel sacred? That sounded intriguing. I mean, steel is a pretty common material. It's made from heating iron and carbon, and there's nothing inherently special. Iron is very common. It's everywhere. It's a very soft metal. So let me geek out for a second. The iron molecule is shaped like a sugar cube. And when you heat it, this cube expands, and the atoms are arrayed like a checkerboard. It opens up, and if you add, so it becomes molten iron. But if you add carbon, from ash or charcoal, the carbon atoms go in there and fill in all the spaces, and when you cool this down, it wants to go back into its original shape, but the carbon prevents it, and now it's in an entirely new shape, and that's steel. But like any recipe, uh, how it's done and the quality of the ingredients makes all the difference of whether you end up with something that looks like a diamond or whether it's just quartz. But what I learned was that the steel used to create these objects was a perfect example of beauty from both an aesthetic and a scientific point of view, and that the formal quality had some kind of, had some kind of perfection about it. So looking past the folklore of the samurai and the fearsome weapons, you could see this thing that they had done with the forging process. So in, in almost all pre-modern cultures, uh, matter and spirit were thought to be interfused, and it wasn't hard for them to imagine that an object could have power, what's called a numinous power. 
and otherworldly power. And over a thousand years ago, artisans in Japan built upon earlier techniques from Korea and China, and they invented a way to make the strongest and purest steel that had ever been made. And they used fire alone to do it, and they used their eyes alone to do it, and they used some kind of crazy intuition that nobody understands to do it. And to ensure quality control, they performed this transformation as a ritual, a ritual that could be passed down from generation to generation to future artisans. Present day, engineers and scientists examine from the biggest steel companies could not fathom how they did it. They examined these ancient swords with electron microscopes and they were stunned because the beauty of the surface of the metal and the jewel-like internal structure were the result of, of this exotic mixing and layering and stretching and folding this pure steel that they figured out how to make. How did the ancient artisans do it? Without science, without technology, without understanding the chemistry, with some kind of vision that no one understands, they mastered this using the heat of a blast furnace that they invented called Tatara. Pushing heat and their power to see to a new level, they achieved a physical transformation through fire that was considered spiritual. Tatara is a large clay oven. It's a big kiln. It's a fire-breathing dragon. It's this big square box, and it's it's open at the top, and at the bottom, it's built into the ground with a chamber to keep it all dry. And they have these bellows attached to holes so that the whole thing can breathe. And a kiln master directs a Tatara blast, a ceremonial burning in the furnace. There are only a few people left in the world alive who know how to do this in the ancient way. Akira Kihara is considered a national treasure in his country, receiving special recognition to preserve these rituals. And it takes place only in winter, way out in the countryside, in the Shimane prefecture. At dawn on the first day, he directs artisans to start a fire of pine charcoal. And when the charcoal has been raised to a tremendous heat, they start to add sand made of iron, which has been gathered from the stream beds along the slopes of volcanoes, where the iron has come up from the heart of the earth. This sand is a very pure form of iron, and over the course of the next three days, he will not sleep. Instead, he will focus on the fire and direct the heating of the Tatara. Over 12 tons of sand and charcoal will be added to the bed of fire within the Tatara to produce one ton of Tamahagane steel. Tamahagane translates as jewel steel. And this is what was forged into samurai swords. He watches the character of the fire until it becomes finely tuned around the 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are some tense moments at the end of the burn. Did he see the right color of the furnace? And what did he see exactly? He determines somehow by listening and by seeing that a special transformation has occurred, and then he orders the destruction of the Tatara revealing the molten jewel steel at the bottom of the pit. Well, this story really struck me. And using your vision alone to direct a blast furnace is crazy. I wanted to tell this story using the text of the story itself as the source for the image. So I researched libraries and online databases from museums about the Tatara and a lot of this material has found its way into the work. I'm trained in classic art techniques, but I've struck out in new territory with digital tools. I use computers because, uh, because I'm weird. <laughs> but this is the arc of things. Computers are everywhere, but more importantly, what computers can do when they're connected to telescopes or microscopes has expanded and altered our vision of the world forever. And I'm grateful to be living in a time when such knowledge is possible. I also believe we're moving a little too fast to have careful thought about how these things will impact our lives in the future. 
It's dangerous the new speed of this knowledge, and we have to make sure that we have a say about where it goes. But I like the idea of saying something with these tools and trying to keep up and trying to be thoughtful at the same time. This painting is called Tamahagane. It's in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It's also composed from text, from the forging of samurai swords, from sand and charcoal. It contains the story of the sacred fusing of steel along with the names of cultural objects from the MFA's large collection of Asian artifacts, names of objects from the National Museum of Tokyo, and other institutions from around the world. It's a Western painting with the Eastern influence but ultimately, it's a painting about transformation. The subject is a gateway to thinking about the legacy of creation and destruction and unleashing energy. So when I received a commission for Tatara Fire, I was pretty along with this material. I was pretty far along working with this material. Uh, the museum had approved some early proposals for the piece. But then I got an interesting phone call from their chief curator, Will South. He understood that I worked with text, and he said there was a desire on the part of the museum to see if there was some way that I could bring some of Columbia's cultural history into the artwork. And I thought, okay, what does that mean? This is when we first discussed the approaching 150th anniversary that they would be observing in remembrance of the burning of the city on February 17, 1865, and I thought, okay, this is serious. I saw the possibility of creating new work that combined the theme of transformation through fire, but this work would bring different influences together. So I worked the names and locations of some of the buildings that were destroyed in the fire into the piece, and it was beyond the scope of the commission to directly memorialize the event, but by including the names of the places ravaged by war, along with the local histories, this could serve to create the right context for the artwork and perhaps inspire conversations. These are some of the landmarks whose names are woven into the image. City Hall, Christ Episcopal Church, South Carolina State Armory, State House, Carolina's National Bank. And the mural was well received by the community. With a lot of groups visiting and many school kids visiting asking wonderful questions. Um, a lot of work in a studio practice is uh, problem solving and asking the right questions. At, at, at any given time, there can be several problems in need of solutions. For me, one problem, obviously, is the new, new thing. You know, what's next? Um, this obsession with digital technology. Our lives are slipping further and further into mirror images of ourselves online, and how are we supposed to differentiate between the virtual and the real our faces are forever turned downward into our screens of our personal communication devices and it draws us physically tighter while our experience is teleported out into this vast beyond without any awareness of this dichotomy. This disconnect is part of the new, new thing and it's a problem if it's not balanced in some way. Another problem is working with abstraction which has been around long enough to have been covered by many, many angles. And I chose abstraction because we live in the golden age of abstract pattern recognition. It's the age of mathematics, the most abstract language of them all. And unseen calculations govern every aspect of our daily lives, our patterns, our movements. There's pattern analysis software out there with a new language that reveals powerful analytics used by corporations and governments to inspect the very fabric of everything we do. Well, the problem here is, how do you harness this and make pictures about it? Another problem is scale. I mentioned that earlier, and this is a very key 
problem when you're dealing with something that doesn't quite exist. And I mean, I'm talking about scale in the real world versus, versus this, the imaginary uh, world of the virtual. I'm constantly reminding myself to look upward from my screens and to think beyond my personal bubble. And when I do, I'm taking note of the relative distance of things in the real world and, and surprised by it. Here's the, the first stanza of Wallace Stevens' wonderful poem of the surface of things. In my room, the world is beyond my understanding. But when I walk, I see it consists of three or four hills in a cloud. With this simple still life image, Stevens is expressing to me that change in one's experience of scale can be a comfort when we're searching for answers, trying to find our place in the greater scheme. I think it's fair to say that our sense of scale in general is shaped by our own bodies and how we fit into the scheme of physical things. The notion of how far is far and how near is near, and how big is big and how small is small is based on our ability to judge our relationship to the physical world with our attention. So while I'm spending so much time thinking about imaginary space, I'm disoriented and I'm, I'm trying to work on a canvas inside of a computer and it has no real size. And Tatar fire had no real dimensions that I could feel. It was like moon rocks that you brought back from the moon, but you couldn't touch them because they were in this glove box. So you had this sort of barrier between you and the thing. And the glove box for me is something called vector space. It's a little bit of a technical breakdown on, on how this works, but we'll circle back. Vector space is a set of mathematical values for drawing curves and shapes and colors. It's like little street signs that point in different directions of, of, in computer code. And uh, it tells the artwork how to behave. So in my work, there's no automation or decision making by the computer at all. It all comes from me by hand and it's done with a digital stylus. The strange part is that I'm not really touching the artwork. Artists have always had a very intimate relationship with our materials. You draw with pencils, or you paint with brushes, you mold with clay, you chisel marble, all of this takes place within the personal space of the body, and you have this direct contact, and you get feedback physically by how, you know, how it's behaving, you know how it's going. So I've gone from holding this thing to looking up and holding a tablet and a digital brush and looking at a screen and not at my hands, and it's very odd. But it's still a strange kind of intimacy. It's a new intimacy. It's a 21st century kind of intimacy. I think that most people are aware of the space around them. We're here in this community room, and it's built to human scale. There is, um, there's, there's a, let's say there's a, there's a space around our bodies, a sphere of influence that extends out to the reach of our arms, maybe five or six feet. And uh, we exist within this personal space and we can relate to objects and move through environments and we know what's near and what's far, we hold things close, we hold them away. And this personal space defines our concepts about scale. That's pretty obvious. But things begin to break down quickly once we look a little bit farther out. And they become kind of abstract. I believe that everything more than 50 feet from us starts to become far. And then anything more than 100 feet away is very far. And that's about it. Everything flattens out into this vague idea of very far away. It doesn't matter if it's across the street, or across town, or across the country, it's just hard to imagine how we can relate to it because it's just very far. So I felt like I needed to practice connecting to these distances with my own personal feeling of scale and space, and perhaps have a bird's eye view of things. And I needed to be able to 
project out of this bubble way out there and see the shape of things as they actually are. You can do this with thought experiments. And I'd like you to try one with me, where we try to imagine what it feels like to expand our sense of scale. I was at the Brooklyn waterfront one evening a couple summers ago, and uh, I was on the pier uh, on the East River across from Manhattan, and it was a beautiful summer evening, late in the summer at sunset. And folks had gathered, as you do, to enjoy it. And you might remember there was something called a supermoon that was about to rise. That's what everyone was waiting for. This meant that the moon, whose orbit around us is not a perfect circle, was a couple thousand miles closer to us than usual. And uh, while we waited, I overheard two women talking. They were discussing their weekend because it was Sunday. And uh, the one said to her friend, did you see the moon last night? And her friend said, no, I missed it. And the woman said, I was driving back to New York and I'm lost in thought. And I'm driving down the straight road and I come around a curve and there it was, this gigantic moon up in the sky. It reminded me I was on a planet. <laughs> and I had to smile because those are words to live by. That's my mantra now. I try to remind myself I'm on a planet every day. Her epiphany about the moon and where we live is so always on my mind. As a way to expand my awareness and remind myself where I actually am. This is not intuitive because the Earth is so big and we're so small, but it seems like we're on a large flat surface, but we all know that's not the case. The moon is a wonderful gift. It might be fair to say that most people overlook the moon, unless it's appearing as some villain in a strange work of fiction where people turn into bloodthirsty monsters every time it's full, which never made any sense to me. Its appearance in poetry and literature is a symbol of mystery, and its power to transform ordinary nighttime into something portentous is the result of our collective instinct that it is a real place, but it's so far away that it allows us to project these myths onto it, which is, which is beautiful, but it's also beautiful to contemplate it as it actually is. What it is, is an enormous, stunning, natural sculpture. It's a sphere of rough-hewn stone and glass whose surface was molded and sculpted by the fiery impacts of boulders and rocks raining down for thousands of years causing so much heat that the entire surface was molten lava, much like our own planet. Only in our world, the forces of time and weather and geology have mostly erased this history when it was engulfed in fire. It's the moon that has allowed the Earth to capture an atmosphere and create oceans. And the transformation through fire stopped short on the moon, sculpting the surface into a permanent ruin of its creation. Our little sister world makes the tides here on Earth and holds our atmosphere together and is locked in a circular dance with us. And since we've traveled there, it remains very far away, but it's no longer unattainable. I'd sure like to go there and see it up close. <laughs> but it's pretty far, right? It's pretty far away. I mean, as a thought experiment, can we imagine how far away the moon is and know what that really feels like, or is it too far? There's this big thing, and it's out there, and it's the closest really big thing there is, but it's some distance away. Does anybody know how far away the moon is? It's about 240,000 miles away. That seems pretty far, but I mean, could I walk there? In the thought experiment, you know, there'd be this magic bridge and it would come straight up out of the ground and then up would turn to out and out would go all the way across the sky, finally coming down onto the surface of the moon. That's a very long bridge and it's a lot of walking. 
you know, walking is another personal sphere of our awareness. It's a good way to gauge and feel the actual size of things. Lots of folks enjoy walking around in cities where they live, and we can walk several miles a day without thinking about it, going from place to place. Traveling by walking, we take our personal perspective with us. So, could I walk to Manhattan? It's about 25 miles. If I was a pretty good runner, which I'm not, I'd get there maybe in under five hours. Walking, I guess, all day? A nice all day walk into New York City. Could I walk to Chicago? That's 713 miles. That would probably take months. Could I walk to Los Angeles? That's 2,400 miles. That might take a year or more. Our distant ancestors did a lot of walking through migration, so could we walk to the moon? The journey would be something like this. The average moderately active person takes about 7,500 steps a day. Assuming that that person walks every day, an 80-year-old person who began walking at one year of age would have taken 216,262,500 steps in their lifetime. An average person with an average stride will walk about 108,131 miles in their life. Hmm. That's not even halfway there. <laughs> it would take two whole lifetimes to walk to the moon. That's something I can feel because it connects to my own personal space. And I think about it when the moon rises. And then when that sinks in, you can begin to think about feeling the distance maybe to Mars. But let's not go there tonight. That's 448 million miles. Um, I would say one more thing about a bridge between worlds. You know, sometimes when I look at Tatara fire, I see the shape of flames moving across the surface. But sometimes I also see a great bridge across the face of the painting. And uh, if I go back to Japanese culture for a moment, and what don't they do well from an aesthetic point of view? In traditional Japanese gardens, the world is represented in miniature with small stones and rocks placed exactly so, so that they can suddenly resemble a mountain range. And now there's that importance of scale again, uh, bringing comfort. And quite often, there is a bridge that leads to a small island in the center of the garden. And when you start on that bridge, you're supposed to leave the material world behind you, and by the time you cross over to the island, you've arrived at a spiritual place leaving the everyday world behind you. And you can experience great calm and peace and healing there. I appreciate that idea that such a journey can be part of the everyday life of all of us along the walk in the park. So before I wrap up, I, I'd like to briefly share some details. I hope it's not too technical. Um, about my practice. I mentioned when I start a new work that I use text, as I do in these two pieces, from literature, stories, poetry, or data about something that I'm interested in. I take the words and I put them into a word processor, I make some changes and I edit them, and then the words get copied into a vector art program, like a least Illustrator program. And now the words are in sort of a mathematical limbo. I can reach into this virtual space, into that vector space, and manipulate the shapes, think about the scale, and try and get perspective on how it should all look. And in the end, the artwork retains the original words, but their shapes have been altered. Then the stories can exist on multiple levels simultaneously. On one level, it's the visual language of abstract painting, and on another level, it's the actual language, which has been transformed by hand into these forms. You run the whole process backwards, 
and the painting untangles itself into 10,000 legible words. And once the artwork is completed, it needs to come back into the real world to be considered a painting. And in order to do this, I use industrial inkjet printers. There's a storied history of artists co-opting industrial processes to make fine art. Picasso, for example, he used commercial newsprint with his superb collages. He used commercially printed text of newspaper articles to reference the political issues in Spain in the 1920s. In the 1960s, Andy Warhol started using industrial silk screens on his canvases. Industrial silk screens, they were considered at the time to be a lowly and cheap form of advertising. Um, uh, he pushed pretty radically on what a painting could be. Robert Rauschenberg also pushed pretty hard on the boundaries of what could be considered a painting. With his silk screens and objects on his canvases. And recently, Wade Guyton has used inkjet printers to print directly on his canvases. Ancient printers came into wide use in the 1990s. And a few years ago, these printers were scaled up to service the commercial printing industry. I'm referring to the huge litho offset presses, commercial presses that use enamel inks to print magazines and the glossy blue car brochures. Uh, it's time consuming and costly to ink up these machines, and inkjet printers changed all that. All the big printing presses in New York, on 7th Avenue, and out in Italy and Germany. They started using them to prove their color samples, saving time and money, but they used them for commercial jobs, not for fine art. I've been making art with small inkjet printers we all use to print our resumes. I would send long sheets of paper through, and then I would paste them together into these larger art books. So I flipped out when I started making these bigger machines. I started attending trade shows for commercial printers, and I asked a lot of confusing questions about the archival qualities of digital printing on canvas, and how could I get a hold of one of these things? And they looked at me like I was from Mars. <laughs> I might be. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you that Tatara Fire was rendered, or painted, with an awesome brand new technology. It's a large-scale industrial inkjet machine, and it's the size of a bus. It uses acrylic water-based pigments and ultraviolet light to fuse the color onto the canvas. It's archival and it's water-based, and this makes it non-toxic for those who work with this machine. And luckily for me, when I came knocking on their door at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, they were happy to let me take over the place for a while. Here's the painting being rendered infused with ultraviolet light. The heat is nothing like a Tatara, but in a similar way, there is a transformation through heat that happens when the acrylic pigments are fused. And I believe that's another important layer to the story. I reflected while creating these artworks that fire can purify as well as destroy. And perhaps there's space to consider that in the light of honoring the memory of those who've gone before us and what it is we intend to do going forward from here. Thank you for listening and happy summer.